What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. So, we got a fun one today, which was surprising to me in a lot of ways. So, our, I'll start with our question, which was, what if you had Aquaman's powers? And now me, I was like, man, this is going to be like finding out like how you can turn a bunch of dopey abilities into something that's useful. Turns out, I do not know a lot about Aquaman, because there is some crazy... <laughs> crazy stuff that he's been up to i mean pretty much all the sources that we found there is some sort of sentence in there that's like aquaman is always underrated yeah because like he has the like yeah his shtick is the the fish thing you know he can talk to fishes would you describe it as his fish stick <laughs> yeah his fish stick is that he has he can talk to the fishes but also he has like comparable like strength speed physical endurance and all this crap to like superman like he just has all the superhero powers he just decided to be water themed so so fun fact as um hi i'm a huge nerd this should hopefully be evident at this point if you listen to this podcast literally ever i i read comics occasionally and there was actually for a while like the a big thing in the comic was that everyone thought that aquaman's a joke like canonically everyone thinks aquaman's a joke which is incredible <laughs> I love how you managed to piss everyone off with the same sense with, I'm a huge nerd, I read comics occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you're an occasional nerd. <laughs> but yeah, so a, cu- a couple, I guess, caveats here for you Aqua fans listening. Aquaman has done a lot of nonsense in all the different, and I'm going to say this, inconsistent universes that he's in. There's been like, it goes from just like, he is just a fish man to like, Okay, I can bend time and space to my will and, you know, connect it to all life on Earth, not just the fishes, and all these wild, over-the-top, power creep type things. So we, we tried to kind of pick the powers where it was kind of more in line with the, the layman's understanding of Aquaman, where he, we, you know, the super strength, super speed, all that superhero stuff, fine, but it's kind of just like the, the fish-themed things that are reasonable. Yeah, fish and water are the main things with Aquaman. Yeah, his domain is the ocean... And the and those powers, but we're not going the, the like the ins- expanded version of Aquaman that can do a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, did you guys consider that like some and sometimes Aquaman can fly? I I saw that. I also like that no one was really sure why that would be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> not even the person that wrote it. Well, no, it's great because, because like it doesn't make any sense because the reason he has like the power he does is that he's from Atlantis, like, and he's super powerful by atlantean standards but like that's the source of it so that's underwater why would he fly (laughs) that's kind of the same thing as superman then right because he's kryptonian yeah but his backstory isn't that his backstory is he's an alien not that he lives underwater right (laughs) yeah but i don't think he could originally fly i think he could just jump really far and that's because he was super strong because he's kryptonian but then they made him fly some for some reason uh, he's actually constantly farting at like just the right amount. <laughs> no, I like I like to imagine that it's just micro mu- like micro muscle movements in like his pecs and toes that just hit, hit the air just enough to keep him afloat. His tiny micro wings on his skin. Yeah, there we go. But I mean, yeah, it's and and this happens every time we we research superheroes. Like the the the, the online community for them is great, but also some of them were unnecessarily thorough. So, like, you're looking at the, the fandom page for all the powers that Aquaman has, and it goes real deep. For example, um, did you know he has one of his powers is uh, multilingualism? Because apparently at some point he spoke a little bit of Polynesian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another noted ability of his is driving, because one time he drove a bus. So there's <laughs> there's a lot of info. Just list every single thing that he's ever done. Yeah. So... Again, we we'll, we'll specify as we go through our answers which ones you know we consider to be Aquaman canon for our answers. Oh, you mean I can't I can't use the drive a bus thing? You you can you can just be like I I decided to use the part where he can drive a bus. That's oh, fine. Okay, okay. Also, we're not literally Aquaman. We just have Aquaman's power, so we don't have to. So we're not in Aquaman's world. Like Superman doesn't exist. Yeah, we're not in the world. There's no Atlantis. Recently, there's no Atlantis in my answer anyway. 
and uh, you know, no one knows us as Aquaman, so we can't use like his reputation or anything. So it's just, just you just have Aquaman's powers. So then, what do you do with them? So I guess I'll start. I wanted to do something ocean because again, you have all this, the 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 Supermanish powers, so you can do pretty much anything you want and have you know a quote unquote successful career. But I want to do something specific to his abilities, and where I ended up is basically a treasure hunt. So according to the United States Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, there are approximately three million shipwrecks scattered across the ocean floor, which sounds like a lot of shipwrecks. But also the ocean is quite big. So the ocean area is 362 million square kilometers, which leaves us with approximately one wreck every 120 square kilometers, which is still a pretty dense ratio. Like an 11 by 11 kilometer square, you know, on average will have one shipwreck in it, which is not a big, big area. I mean, this 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 study by the UN really it did include like everything that could be considered a shipwreck, like from a 10,000 year old canoe to like a you know a modern submarine so they had a pretty broad definition but still a lot of shipwrecks so i was kind of looking through it and uh aquaman is quite well suited for this um what the main thing is so he has um first he has enhanced hearing so he can use um like sonar and sounds underwater to you know be able to more you know get uh, a good view of where things are which is you know how they find shipwrecks in real life they use sonar generally does he like make a noise for the sonar? <laughs> um, I think it's one of those things where he can hear and feel the ripples of other things around him. Uh, okay. You know, depending on which one they decide to to call out in that particular instance. Um, but even more than that, he has like enhanced vision, is what they're calling it. But it basically his vision just works regardless of how deep in the ocean he is. So he can just see at the bottom of the ocean as if it were a clear day. So he can just like look around as if the water was air. Even though there's, like, no light. Even though there's no light. It's just, like, he can just see great. So, really, with all that, it's pretty easy for him to go just, you know, swim around, scan around, see one, you know, swim down, and probably <laughs> pull it out of the ground by himself, to, you know, without too much trouble. But we're, we're, we're living the dream here. We got superpowers. Let's be ambitious. What if I wanted to claim all the shipwrecks because realistically even if it's easy for me to find them i can't imagine getting more than like one or two ships a day which mean to get those three million ships it would take me two million days or 5400 years to collect all the ships and that kind of discounts the fact that more shipwrecks would be popping up in that time so it would probably take you know well longer than that and <laughs> it's not even we're not even pulling them out at a much higher rate than they're happening so we're going to need some help, which luckily is basically Aquaman's whole fish stick. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let, let's talk to the fishes and see how they can help us out. So again, as we've been saying, there's some variation in Aquaman's powers about how Aquaman's telepathy works. So it ranges basically from creatures he just directly encounters to he can communicate with anything worldwide with ease. Um, and then the degree he can control them varies as well based on different sources of red. Some say he can just, like, straight control them. Some say he only has the power to, like, suggest things to them and they have to want to do it. And some say he can control them, but chooses to only use them consensually, like, when they want to help him. Because he's the good guy. Yeah, because he's the good guy. So I, I ended up kind of taking it in between where he has a fair amount of range, like, you know, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of miles. It's not really particularly relevant how the range of his ability for what I'm doing. And basically... I did like the idea that the animal he's communicating with has to be intelligent enough to understand the directions given. So you can't, like, program a fish. You have to be able to, like, relay instructions to an animal that can understand it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start with recruiting the two smartest creatures in the ocean. Well, two of the smartest. I'm not sure the exact numbers. But going with dolphins and whales. There's a couple things going for this combination. Like I said, they're two of the smartest animals. Interestingly... Dolphins and whales actually have a more advanced limbic system in us in their brain, which is their like emotional and like social interaction processing center. So whales and dolphins can feel things that you guys mean you don't even understand. They got so many emotions. I guess dolphins still choose to be pricks, but you know, maybe they feel bad about things. They're also 
pretty big, which is helpful when you're dealing with, you know, ship sized things and they can travel pretty far. You know, they, they all have, you know, pretty long migratory routes. So you don't have to worry about them not being able to get to different parts of the ocean or, you know, being stuck in a reef somewhere. They have, um, at least the dolphins, they have echolocation, which I'll, which I'll get to in a minute. And probably the best of all is that these two, spe these two animals are already best friends. So I saw a video they, they took off the coast of Hawaii with dolphins and humpback whales playing with each other. And what would happen is, is they'd have the humpback whale, like the dolphin would rest on the nose of the humpback whale. And the humpback whale would like slowly raise the dolphin out of the water until the dolphin like slid down its back and like splashed into the, into the surface. And they like, were just doing this like over and over in like a non-aggressive way. And like they saw it like at one island and saw it like, you know, a bit later with different humpback whale over by another island. And like, yeah, this is just them in like having fun because they're bored, I guess. No, I, I want to see this. It's awesome. <laughs> the one the one I saw on my on my brief Googling, because I did want to see the video, I saw the, the, just a series of photos in a video. And I'm like, there's probably a video of this somewhere, but I'm going to do some digging after this. Do you know what I can search to find it after this podcast? You can literally just search humpback whales and dolphins playing and it'll it'll pop up. Hawaii if you need to narrow it down a little bit extra. So this is gonna be our this is gonna be our key crew. And like I said, you can do it all by yourself, it's gonna take forever. So let's I set a kind of like I would wanna do this for at most ten years of searching. So what would we need to get that done? So just numbers wise, is we would need to find about five hundred and fifty shipwrecks per day to get on pace to get to finish in 10 years so let's say over the long term our crew ends up having like a 20 25 ish somewhere in that range percent success at finding one like each individual pod of dolphins and whales that we send out so if we do that we'd need about 2,000 whale dolphin crews so assuming all the humpback whales and the dolphins in the ocean are down to do treasure hunts because why wouldn't they be they have nothing better to do with their time there are between 120 and 150,000 humpback whales and about 600,000 bottlenose dolphins in the ocean, which lets us max out our pods as 60 whales and 300 dolphins each, which I think is going to be a pretty clean sweep for like a, you know, 11 kilometer territory. So that will be pretty good. So we can have basically this crew of whales and dolphins scouring the ocean floor and uh, being like, oh, there's a ship. And I think you could even have, you know, the whales be the muscle to actually get the shipwrecks out of the seabed and bring them to, well, imagine once you have your first shipwreck and cash in and have some other people on some shores, you know, cashing in the, the gold and the loot and the, uh, and the scrap metal from all these ships you're bringing up. So it's going to be a bit of an operation, but that's the whole point. There is one snag here, though, and it's that the bottom of the ocean is like very sandy and silty and all these ships aren't necessarily just sitting there at the bottom in, in you know the the typical like wow look at the big mass sticking out many of them especially a lot of the older ones could be entirely buried in silt and sand and clay and all that luckily there we have this echolocation so when they actually do a lot like i said what like i mentioned before the way they find these shipwrecks in the first place is to do like they call it side sonar and basically you shoot the sonar at an angle and then anything that's jutting out, like, you know, a mast of a ship or, you know, the, the front end sticking out, it'll kind of cast a shadow behind it because the sound will hit it. And then there'll be like this blank area that'll kind of create the shape of what you're seeing. And one of the things that they, they note with this, this technique is that they won't know if the ship is entirely buried, like half buried or not, because the, the sand and everything, it just penetrates through it, bounces off. And it just paints what it bounces off of. So basically there's a range of frequencies that you can create that'll let you penetrate different amounts into the into the sandy layer. So again, dolphin echo dolphin echolocation works basically like sonar, where they just make a noise, bounces off things, and they hear it. And so typically they operate at high frequencies, which are better for small short distances, something in like the 130 150 kilohertz range which is a problem because those frequencies only penetrate like two feet into the into the bottom of the of the sand but they don't have to go that high they don't have to pick those high pitch squeeze they can they can actually dial it back all the way to 0.2 kilohertz 
um, is the range of a dolphin click. So pretty much, I think the sweet spot is the, the 6.5 kilohertz range is kind of what they're using when they're looking for stuff in the sandy layer, and it, and it penetrates about 30 meters down into the sand. So you, you'll be able to find sunken ships that are up to, you know, 80 feet down in, the, in that sandy layer. Interestingly, because I, I was checking with whales too to see if they would, so so dolphins obviously they can hear the they can hear the the sounds they produce, so they'd be able to hear you know and and navigate off of those lower frequencies. And I, so I was checking it for whales, and whales kind of crazily, like the dolphins has a minimum of 0.2. They can go a whale can go all the way down to 0.03 kilohertz or just 30 hertz for the frequency of their sound. And what they can do is they can pair this along with like just being also incredibly loud so this 30 hertz is, is well below the human ability to hear and this the magnitude of the sound is 188 decibels which is 50 decibels louder than a jet engine and even eight decibels louder than a rocket launch so you can actually if you are a whale you can hear other whales making the sound up to 500 miles away. Did I? That sounds familiar. Did I say that in episode one? You might have. It, we may have talked about episode one. It was a fact I, I remembered from way back when. I think it may have been a thing that we considered including in our answers, but didn't fit in what we were doing. Well, I did whale songs in, in episode one, so I think I might have covered it. All right, Chris, you got me. 121 <laughs> episodes ago, you said the same fact, so I probably shouldn't mention it. You plagiarized me. <laughs> but yes, 500 fracking miles whales can hear each other from, which is just insane. So basically, this is, this is why I wasn't worried about, you know, my range on communication, because if I need to just use a whale relay stations, I can just do that. So... Then it's really just a matter of, hey, can you, like, get these ships hooked up to whales and, and, and you know, kind of pull things out? And the answer is generally going to be yes. Like, you have a lot of manpower or whale power with, with 60 whales. And if you need to recruit, like, a more dexterous sea creature to, like, make, you know, tie ropes to the whales and things and do all the little fiddly bits, like, you can make an octopus do basically anything. So you can kind of just, like make that work and add what you need for the tiny logistics i'm not worrying too much about those but i really don't see too much why this team wouldn't work except for one little caveat i have here at the end that i found out real late in my research but i left my answer the way it was and it's uh it's a fairly big caveat but it was a little late to change it so the caveat is that humpback whales and dolphins actually only dive to about 600 800 feet the ocean generally is a lot deeper than that like a lot a lot deeper and then i was like oh let me just switch the whale up and the deepest diving whale is the uh the beaked whale which can dive down three thousand meters which does cover a good portion of the ocean but that's not even the ocean's like straight up average depth so the the sad thing the little sad thing about my answer is that theoretically the dolphin and the whales couldn't dive deep enough but otherwise it works. You can do the shallows. That's where most of the boats are going to be anyway. So a little sad at the end, but otherwise you have a real good treasure hunting crew. Ben, what did you do? Yeah, so I decided pretty early on in the process that in the grand tradition of us using some sort of, you know, powers or abilities or animals, I was going to steal something. It's kind of what we do on the podcast. Really, anytime we get a chance is plan some kind of heist. Oh, you're doing a heist. I thought you were like, you're going to steal like a oh, thing no, from no, like no. another, <laughs> like, like an idea stolen. You're going to steal my, my whale fact from episode one. No, excuse me. <laughs> we're going to make Aquaman steal things or not actually Aquaman, but our Aquaman adjacent, you know. You are going to steal things with Aquaman's powers. Aquaben. I, now, that, now that I have stolen Aquaman's powers, I will now steal other things. There we go. <laughs> do you want to be Aqua, do you want to be Aquaben or Bakwaman? <laughs> Ooh, Baco Man sounds like he's chicken related. So I'm gonna go with Aqua Ben. Aqua Ben is definitely the better one, but I like Baco Man. <laughs> Baco Man is pretty great. Um, there's, there's that. <laughs> I just realized that I can't. I can't go through with saying what both of your names are. Yeah. Then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Moving on. Um, so I started looking into to heist possibilities. 
And I quickly realized that there aren't very many like secure locations that are in, you know, water. And technically, as we discussed, Aquaman has lots of powers outside of water, but it felt really, you know, not entirely in the spirit of the thing to say that I was going to go like punch the door off of Fort Knox because that doesn't feel particularly like I'm using all these abilities to the fullest. Yeah, even though you could, it's real off brand for Aquaman. <laughs> it, it's not really, you know, keeping in his style. So what I eventually uh, thought of was, you know, well, what if we could steal something that is transported over water? And after I looked into that a little bit, easily the most consistently valuable thing and most, you know, consistently, consistently like attainable thing is going to be a cargo ship full of cars. There are a lot of cars imported to the U.S. each year. Sort of put things into perspective. Just from, J- from Japan, there were, in 2019, $39.9 billion worth of cars imported, um, which apparently was only about a quarter of the U- cars imported to the U.S., which sounds wrong, but I got it from a government website. Well, it could be, it's you know, it's from Japan. Maybe there was one, like, $39 billion car and a bunch of, like, regular ones. Well, I mean, that <laughs> that seems unlikely. I, I like the idea as a car carrier with just, like, one, like, super Ferrari and also a bunch of Matchbox cars. <laughs> <laughs> or just, like, car-shaped cardboard boxes with, like, wheels drawn on. <laughs> but, yeah, so obviously, a lot of money there. One car carrier, which I looked into, and are actually pretty awesome. They, like... So apparently for a long time, it was kind of an issue, like how you would import cars just because, you know, they by nature roll around a lot. And um, if they hit each other, it's, you know, very costly. Um, And eventually they figured out ways to like, you know, make these dedicated ships that would just carry cars where you could like have multiple straps across each car and pull them all, you know, within like six inches of each other and just let the suspensions like hold them in place. It's pretty cool. But they're pretty perfect. Each one holds four to 6,000 cars, which even just using, you know, normal consumer cars, not, you know, crazy fancy cars is at least like $100 million or so in cars. Um, And they're only crewed by like 20 or 30 people. So it's not a huge, you know, crew you'd have to deal with if things kind of broke bad. (laughs) Not a huge body count is what you're implying? (laughs) No, I'm not saying, well, I think that, I think that once they realize what was happening, they kind of give up because... Aquaman is also like impervious to small arms and everything, but uh, more just you know, if something had to go down, you could probably take them. It's not that many people. Um, <laughs> Bakwaman box at your futile efforts. <laughs> he he boxes at okay. Anyway, um, I I can't I can't with Bakwaman. He box then boxes. <laughs> so we had to figure out the best way to actually you know hijack this ship. And I figure I start with the simplest method first, which is basically Aquaman grabbing the ship and swimming away with it, which I didn't really think was a possibility until I was researching Aquaman and found out that even in the, what I'll refer to as the more recent non-bullshit time of Aquaman comic books, (laughs) he apparently once outraced a spy plane that could fly like Mach 5, which is 3,800 miles per hour. So grain of salt on that one, but I'm going to say that Aquaman could swim at 3,800 miles per hour. This is, I will admit, pretty fast. It would mean he could take him to the globe in about six and a half hours. Bear with me. It winds up not mattering that much, so we're just going to roll with it. So, let's do some quick physics math. If he's swimming that fast, that means that the amount of force he's actually pulling out to move that fast is just enough to counteract the drag force of the water on his body at that speed. So, in order to figure out that drag force, we need the velocity, which we have. We need the density of water, which is... 997 kilograms per meter cubed we need his cross-sectional area which i considered trying to figure that out more by like looking at pictures of aquaman decided that wasn't going to go anywhere and just found a paper where they actually just measured a bunch of swimmers and the average area for for men in a like you know like when you're a dolphin kicking with your arms out like sort of pose was like 124 square inches which um from helpful website the measure of things is about four-fifths of the size of an airplane tray table. Why, of all the things, would you use that as the, <laughs> it as was, the thing that it you was the close, to something else? Marcus, it was that or 14 decks of cards, and that didn't seem very helpful either, dude. <laughs> no, not like that. You picked the wrong thing to compare it to. That you, you, Of all the things you didn't think we have context for, it was like 40 square inches. Like, oh, whatever. I, I mean, go, go, whatever. It's fine. You, you, you get the idea. Okay, it's fine. Whatever. All right. <laughs> it's like the easiest number to imagine of the other numbers that are just way out. Okay. The, out of one of the other numbers was the density of water, which I'm hoping you can figure out on your own. It's a prox. It's a slightly less dense than a glass of milk. Yeah. There you go. 
I actually I would I was gonna the joke I was gonna go with was slightly less dick than a glass of blood, but whatever. Anyway. Hey, blood's thicker than water. Okay, anyway, bad jokes. And then finally we need the drag coefficient, which is just a coefficient you use based on various properties of the object. And that same study was basically trying to figure out the drag coefficient of like uh, you know, national level swimmers. Um, the average they found for men was 0.476. I'm going to say Aquaman can do a 0.35 because he's like basically bred to swim. I couldn't justify going any lower because he is still man shaped and basically a man. So we're going to go with that. <laughs> and it's you. It's not Aquaman. So <laughs> And also it's me. So, you know, whatever. I, I figured whatever weird like aquatic, you know, slickness he had would be a power i'd have to who knows um so we take all of this to throw it in the formula we found out that the the drag force on aquaman when he's swimming at this speed is about 40 million newtons which i just realized that one i don't actually get a comparison for so sorry about that one yeah Marcus. that would be helpful <laughs> would have been helpful it's a big number though i can tell you that that's one. like four million <laughs> tv trays hitting you at once well so what's the what's the um what's the like there's a thing that for a newton isn't a newton like um one oh what's the dumb one they always tell you in physics class what's the way you visualize or not visualize like conceptualize newton there's a thing it's a really dumb thing an advertised app looks there's about one newton of force see that's what i was thinking but it seemed too <laughs> on the nose on the nose yeah <laughs> all right so like an apple if you're holding an apple that's like a newton of force so if you were to hold you know 40 million apples that would be roughly the force that is being exerted on aquaman when we swims at mach 5 so Using that force we have, we can work backwards and figure out how fast he could, you know, swim with a cargo ship and if that would be enough to counteract the speed of a cargo ship and just move where, where he wants it to. So specifically what we're, we're going to look at is the Cougar Ace, which is actually a, a real car carrying ship that capsized and dumped like almost 5,000 Mazdas into the sea uh, like a decade ago, um, which was very bad for Mazda. <laughs> you don't say well unless they had insurance uh, they did have insurance well so it's actually funny they had insurance but it didn't so if it just sunk so this is actually a really interesting little thing because of the way the insurance was written they had to be actually like you know destroyed for them to um you know claim the insurance and the boat capsized but didn't sink but they couldn't get the cars out so they wouldn't pay out the insurance because the technically they hadn't you know they were still kind of accessible but they also couldn't, like, tip the boat over. I didn't wonder how you, like, send a crew in to, like... I don't remember what they did. I don't remember how they resolved it. But, yeah, it was actually a whole thing for a while where the insurance would not pay out. And they were, like, $100 million in the hole for this. Do you think Do you think that the, 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 the insurance... I imagine the insurance intern who thought of this scheme at... Oh, he's <laughs> at the, the CEO now, company, yeah. Like, doing victory laps, like... Guys... The cars aren't destroyed. Yeah. They're just sitting there on the water, totally fine. Yeah, they're still there. Boat's still floating. That's just you can't pay out crazy for that. enough to work. <laughs> what if it rolled back over? We'd look like fools. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take this. This boat, we were able to find the actual dimensions of it. So, so the widest point of the boat is about 105 feet, 10 inches across. And then the, the distance from the water line to the bottom of the boat is about 32 feet down. So... I know this isn't entirely accurate, but I'm going to say that the cross section is a rectangle of that dimensions. Once again, I realize this is completely accurate. Once again, it's not going to wind up mattering in the end. So we'll get there. But that gives us a cross section area of about 3,300 feet. And for the drag coefficient, uh, and this is where you can see how much more finely evolved boats are for swimming than humans. I found a paper that looked at the drag coefficients of ships. And they're between 0 0.0027 and 0 0.0032 for like a big cargo ship. So I'm going to say 0 0.003. Uh, and basically doing the calculation again, I found out that Aquaman at that max speed could move the ship at about 654 miles per hour, which is like 80% the speed of sound, which would clearly not be good for this ship. But the point is Aquaman can very clearly, or me as Aquaman, I guess, could very clearly move a ship around even without having to like disable the engine or do anything just by kind of like swimming at it. And at that point, you kind of just do what you want. Just take it to an island, offload it onto some whales, I don't know, or like a barge pulled by whales. That probably makes more sense. And then, you know, there you go. There are lots of ships carrying cars. Just hit one of those every month or so and you're living large. That's all it takes. It's just that easy. 
All right, you you rob the top of the sea, and I'll and I'll rob the bottom. It's perfect. Mine feels more lucrative. Not gonna lie. Uh, actually, no, because there's a lot of actual big shipwrecks that are still out there, like where you uncover, you know, a cache of you know year 1500 gold bullions or some crap but is that worth as much as like 5000 cars i don't think it is actually it's worth way more okay fair all right but how how often are you gonna find a, a shipwreck like that i don't know good argument <laughs> i mean it's less often than you can find a bunch of cars anyway point being i turned off command to a car thief which is not really explored i expected this to go when i started research here so that's what i did chris what did you do so when I was looking at Aquaman's powers, I didn't want to really talk about the fish thing because I figured that's like the obvious thing. And I kind of figured that one of you guys would cover it. So I want to see like what else can Aquaman do specifically like related to the water that is not fish. So the main thing that I found was that Aquaman is known to go as deep as 20,000 feet under the surface of the water. And at that depth, you can get water pressures of up to 800 atmospheres, so 800 times the air pressure at sea level. That translates to about 12,000 PSI. So he can withstand like very, very high pressures, and I wanted to see if I could try to use that for something. Maybe we can like bring something down there and like pressurize it. He is the ultimate pressure cooker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, what applications are there for super high pressure um, we're not going to cook food with the pressure, but we might be able to use something called high pressure processing. It's also called pascalization, and it's a method of preserving food and sterilizing food. So the way that it works is they they put a sample of food in this chamber, they fill it with water, and then they like pressurize it using pumps until it's like really, really high pressure. And the pressures can get up to around like 40,000 PSI to 87,000 PSI. It's like a bit, pretty big range, but depending on like the pro the specific process, there's little different types. But And they usually hold this pressure for around three to five minutes, and then they let it go. And then that helps preserve the food. Do you, know the, do you have to know the mechanism by which the, the pressure preserves the food? So it, it it's able to kill like a lot of the microorganisms that can be harmful for consumption or even like like degrading the food oh interesting so it's like it's like a, it's like a, it's a way to sanitize it yeah as well right which i guess also preserves it as a as a interesting yeah and and one of the cool things about this process is that it does this without affecting the nutritional value the taste the texture or the appearance of the food so it's actually regarded as a natural method of preservation because it doesn't use any chemical preservatives i imagine it might change the shape of like an egg <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know exactly they had a whole list of foods that they use this for i don't remember what was on it. i know i remember yogurt was on it <laughs> specifically i was gonna say i feel like it's gonna be a lot of it, like more liquidy stuff right that would make sense yeah well they had some they had some more solid stuff too which i'll get to a little bit later but i wanted to see if i can try to mimic this process in the ocean like if i go if i just take some food and dive super deep so at twenty thousand feet below sea level we're only getting twelve thousand psi which isn't anywhere close to what we need the source that i found aquaman's powers that said that he can go as he's been known to go twenty thousand feet deep but i feel like he could go deeper i'm just gonna say that he's he can go as deep as the deepest part of the ocean which is in the mariana trench i feel like he'd be fine there and that is 36,000 feet below sea level. So if you go that deep, then you get up to 16,000 PSI. Still nowhere close to what we need. <laughs> so I don't think water pressure alone is going to be enough for what we want to do. But I was looking at like other ways that we can try to add pressure to this food in addition to the water pressure. And as, as Ben already pointed out, Aquaman is super strong. So... His strength kind of varied depending on what source you looked at. I, some said like 80 tons of force and some said like thousands of tons. And and that one said, uh, was it a tectonic plate moved? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was, <laughs> it was one like place a where, trillion yeah. tons or something. <laughs> I kind of just settled on sort of a middle ground. I said a thousand tons. So if he can exert a thousand tons of force or two million pounds of force, 
then he can maybe use this to just squeeze the food when he's underwater and add some some pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so, like, how much pressure will that actually add to the food? Uh, in order to do this, I had to figure out the surface area of his palms, <laughs> or just I guess my palms. And the average area of an adult male's palm is 12 square inches. And how do you compare? I didn't actually measure my palms. <laughs> I'm going to assume I'm average. So if I squeeze with my 12 square inch palms with my Aquaman strength, I can exert 166,000 additional PSI of pressure, which is way more than we actually need. So I'm going to say, I don't know if this is actually accurate, but I'm going to say that we could do the high pressure processing thing <laughs> by squeezing it. <laughs> so... Okay, we can do it. But how efficient are we compared to like a machine that's designed to do this? So I started looking at like the equipment that they use for high pressure processing. And there are different models. It varies, like the output varies depending on what model you're looking at. But the lower end for like lower capacity ones, they output around 500 kilograms per hour of product. And then the higher end ones or the higher capacity ones output around 3000 kilograms per hour. So how do we compare to that? So I kind of broke up my process into three different steps. So I have to go from the surface of the water. I have to swim all the way down to the bottom. I have to squeeze it and I have to swim back up. So I found the speed that Aquaman can swim. I actually found a different speed than Ben did. That's not surprising to me. Yeah. So I found 175 miles per hour, which sounds way more reasonable than what you said. <laughs> but I don't know who's who's accurate. I'm going to go with 175 miles per hour. And that means that he can go from the surface the from the surface of the water down to the very bottom of the Mariana Trench in 2 minutes and 20 seconds. And then once I'm there, I'm going to squeeze the food for I'm going to say about 5 minutes. And once I'm done with that, I, I swim back up and that's another 2 minutes and 20 seconds. I'm going to round up and say that this this whole cycle takes about 10 minutes to do for like one sample of food. So how much product can I actually squeeze in one cycle of this process? We can, so since the pressure that we're exerting with our hands is actually way higher than we actually need, that means that we can increase the area of our hands to, uh, it'll lower the pressure that we're putting on the food, but it'll increase the amount that we're doing at the same, in one cycle. So if we wear like, gloves that are like huge or a goalie like just a little bit bigger so like goalie gloves i need like 28 inches 28 square inches is what i need to to reach eighty seven thousand psi which is what you need for high pressure processing so 28 oh, 28 square inches i can't imagine that number chris you're crazy it's basically doubling the size <laughs> of my hands <laughs> how many how many trays is that <laughs> i don't know how many trays Wait, but it's on. it's can, roughly 2.3 of my hands <laughs> Is Ben actually looking it up? You you said how many square inches did you say it was? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. So it was one hundred and twenty four. Was eighty percent of a tray table, which means it's like thirty percent of one. Yeah, because I can just imagine what a five by five inch square looks like compared to a tray table. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. okay, you know what that makes sense too. So we can't use a tray table for our hands. So we won't get high enough pressure, but we can get we can like double the size of our hands and it'll be good. So. Six ounces of hamburger makes about like a 12 square inch patty. So that means with our, our double size hands, we can output about 14 hamburgers per hour. And that comes out to about 2.4 kilograms per hour, which again is nowhere close to the, the output of one of these machines that's designed to do this, which is a problem. <laughs> so how can we compete with these machines? <laughs> the machine's taking away taking away Aquaman's job. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Damn it. The thing is, there's like a big setback with high pressure processing, and that is that the equipment that they use is actually super expensive. So there are actually a very limited number of manufacturers that make these machines, and there are two main ones that are competitors. But I looked up the prices of their machines, and at the lower end, you have 500000 dollars for one machine at the higher end you have three million dollars for one machine gee that's a lot of money to squish food <laughs> yeah and then you need like a 24-hour support team for maintenance and stuff so you need to pay them as well so it's a lot of money 
Now, that's where I have the advantage because I don't have that high cost. Just based on my efficiency, if I like scale down the price based on the percentage efficiency that I provide compared to the machine, I think I can get away with charging around like $2,400 a day. That's the number I landed on. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that you're literally just saying, I'm not as good as a machine, but I am cheaper. I am cheaper. You don't have to, you don't have that giant upfront cost. The, the image I can't get out of my head is just using it in your day-to-day life because you know that this squishing thing, like, you know, keeps the meat, whatever, safe. <laughs> so, like, you're just at a restaurant and you just get, like, chicken. It's like, mm, this looks like it might be a little un- undercooked. It's like, hold on, let me have that. And you just <laughs> grab it and you just, like, squish it in your hand while staring at them in the face for, like, five minutes and just hand it back to them. <laughs> and, like, it's safe now. My work here is done. Yeah, again, I don't know exactly if, if that's how it works. I think it does need the water pressure to some extent because the water pressure is like in every direction at the same time, which you can't do with your hands, really. Yeah, not 100%. Otherwise, <laughs> there'd be like just a slight crack between the fingers and just like chicken shooting out at like 100 <laughs> miles an hour across the room. <laughs> just like a silly string of poultry. Yeah. So it probably wouldn't work if you're out of the water. I'm going to say it. I mean, I don't know if it actually works 100% underwater either in the Mariana Trench, but I'm going to say it does if you're squeezing it. (laughs) There's no way I'm going to know for sure, but so it works. And I'm going to charge $2,400 a day. So next I have to figure out what kind of food I'm going to preserve and what and sell to people. And to this, I wanted to see like what countries were close to the Mariana Trench because it needs to be close because that's the only place I can do it really, if I, need, if I need the water pressure as well. So my plan was just to see what's close and then cater to those that cuisine. So the Mariana Trench is located in the western Pacific Ocean. It's about 124 miles east of the Mariana Islands. And the Mariana Islands are actually like super tiny. So they have a, a land area of only 388 square miles, which is a third the size of Rhode Island. So I don't think the Mariana Islands are the best place for me to look for clients i'm gonna try to look for something else and there really isn't there aren't really like any large land masses close to the mariana trench but one of the closest countries is japan and japan is known for seafood and i can control fish i can catch fish super easy which is convenient (laughs) come here come here mr salmon i want to squish you (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it, and uh, high pressure processing is actually particularly effective with seafood. So it kills virobacteria that's found in oysters, so you can eat oysters safely. And it kills Anisakis parasites and other parasites in sushi grade fish. So it can help with sushi, which is really popular in Japan. And they actually often use high pressure processing for like lobster and oysters and other shellfish because the process actually completely separates the meat from the shell without the use of any heat or anything. So like seafood in particular is it's it's very effective with seafood, which is convenient because I'm I have Aquaman's powers. So if I had Aquaman's powers, I would lure in my fellow fish friends. I would squeeze them at the body, bottom of the ocean. I would sell them to Japan for profit. And that's it. The end. So you did actually end up robbing the middle of the ocean because that's where you get the fish from. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I didn't rob them. I just, I'm harvesting them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't count as robbing a shipwreck either. Really, Ben's the only one literally stealing. But it all is, even that is, you know, vague in insurance terms. But uh, yeah, we have, we have robbed the ocean from top to bottom with our... Um, Aquaman slash Baquaman powers. So that'll bring us right over to our Would You Rather. <laughs> All right, Ben. Hmm. Would you rather find a land of giants or a land of people small as mice? Small as mice, you say? How big are the giants? Uh, let's go. Let's go big giants, like thirty foot giants. Okay. Are they friendly? Yeah, this is an important This question. is a very important <laughs> question, because if they're not friendly, I know which one I want to be visiting. <laughs> Let's say that they have, like, a, you know, how you would imagine, like, a fantasy society where they have, like, a vill- you know, they have villages and they're, they can speak, but I, w- I won't guarantee friend or foe. Okay, so they're neutral. Yeah. 
So you don't know what you're getting into. You like you discover them. You you hap you happen upon one of these. I see. So if they wind up not being friendly, going to the giants is very bad because you're boned. There's just no way out of that. But if they're friendly, it's pretty hard to interact with mouse sized people. Well, the giants feel the same way about you, Ben. Oh pfft, mind blown. <laughs> yeah, if if they're not friendly <laughs> if they're not friendly, then there's a good chance even if you're in the giant world, that they might not even notice you. Um, no, they would notice you. They're th- like 30 or foot Or they tall. wouldn't like care about you. They would, well, no, because you would be, you'd be up like, up to like their knees. Yeah, you'd be like, like pets, like less than like cat size to them. 30 feet tall. If you're like six feet tall, you're a fifth their height. That's, that's like, like knee height. Okay. If I saw a person up to my knees, I would regard them as something. I'd say it's it's like dog height, I would say. Yeah. But if I, if you saw something dog height that looked like you, you would have a reaction to it. I feel like that's a pretty, like, you personally, right? Like, if you saw a 1.2 foot person sneaking around your house. So what's, what are the, like, the chances of them being not friendly or like hostile towards you is less because you're less threatening to them that is probably true yeah so the 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 way the way i'm seeing it right now is like the the giants i think are the cooler one to have exist like if you look at okay what if i found a village of small mice people it'd be like okay you just like excavate and pick up their village and like bring it to like a show or something and you have like a really cool exhibit, I guess. And exploit that sounds, them and ruin that sounds their very lives. exploitative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are we not making money off this one? Are we gonna Are we gonna change our ways? Oh no, God! Of course, we're making money off it. We're just figuring it out. I thought we were, we would try to be like friendly with them. Are we no longer leading our fish friends to the Mariana Trench so that they may be squished? <laughs> well, I mean, we eat fish anyway. We don't eat tiny mice men. <laughs> <laughs> just because we haven't found them yet. Also, they're all bony. God, I just feel like it's like... Like the dynamic you're going to have between the relation... Like, to the giant, you're going to be kind of their pet. But to the mice men, you're going to be... Like their god? I guess. It'll be like Gulliver Travels, right? I never actually saw it. (laughs) (laughs) But I know scenes from it. Or it'll be like... um. Night from the museum, or night in the museum. Yeah. Yeah. So, do I just want to deal with a whole bunch of little people? Like, I, I think what it comes down to for me, if they wind up being friendly, the giants are way cooler, in my opinion. I just don't know if I want to take that risk. And the chance of them being friendly is higher. Probably, yeah. I also don't think that if the the, the mouth people aren't friendly it's going to matter all that much to you because i don't really know what they can do to you yeah i actually think the most people will really not change your life at all <laughs> right it'll be like huh, that was cool you go on your way yeah yeah that, that's kind of my first impression too now i'm imagining building them little lego houses to live in and i'd be like <laughs> this is the best that is pretty great it's tricky i i think my gut like i think there's a lot of logical reasons to pick people small as mice with the main one being that you are in control of that situation as opposed to the other way around. But, man, I just want to live a little and pick Land of Giants on this one. It's just, I'd rather that one be true. I think that would just be more exciting. Yeah. Like if you if you saw a person the fifth of your size, your instinct isn't to kill them. <laughs> I have questions. You wouldn't try to harm them, I wouldn't though. try to like, harm them, yeah. So I think there's a good chance that they'll be friendly, and for that reason, I pick Giants. I think, I think... As I mentioned, assuming they're friendly, Giants are just cooler, so yeah, I'm going to go Giants. Awesome. We actually all agree that Giants are cool and little people are shit. <laughs> Fantastic. We agree with Randy Newman. Wait. Yeah, exactly. Wait, what? Wait, uh, what's his name? Not Randy Newman. Uh, what's who, his name? Who are you going for here? Is his name Randy? I'm going to look it up. Who, who? I don't even. I don't. I, I agreed with you. I didn't really mentally process what you Randy said, Newman though. So I also don't know who you're talking about. Who, who wrote... Yes, Randy Newman. <laughs> what? It is Randy Newman. What Look up you... short people. Oh, short people. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. I know it's right. an obscure reference, but 
whatever. Can you explain it so I know what's going on? He wrote a song called Short People where he makes fun of short people. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's Thank the you. extent of it. <laughs> that's all fine. But much like people, <laughs> that's going to sound shitty. Much like our hypothetical here, small is shitty and big is awesome. So we want to ask you to help our podcast grow because the same thing is true for podcasts. Little podcasts can be good, but generally fall into this, the shitty category. Big podcasts, awesome, crazy good. So the best way to help our podcast grow is to just write us a review. Um, it's real quick and easy. I assume I don't write too many reviews on podcast apps, but you can definitely do it. And you guys listening definitely should do as I say, not as I do, but any reviews help the show grow, help it show up in all those fun search engines that people use and just get it out there organically to help the show grow. And it can also just grow by word of mouth. Tell your friends about it. If you, if you enjoyed this, if something comes up where we taught you a fun fact and you use it in a party, you know, You'll have to explain that you heard it on our podcast because it's not going to make any sense why you know that stuff about whales. So that anything that you, the listener, can do to help us grow is so much appreciated. And also, because I have to, also what's appreciated is straight cash dollars, baby. www.patreon.com slash absurd hypotheticals. Become a patron. One dollar a month. Access to behind the scenes episodes. If you listen to any other episode recently, you know the shtick. So there you go. That's the fish stick the fish for stick. <laughs> us fishing for money. But that'll do it for this week. Next week, you are more than welcome to join us for our Earth Questions Grab Bag. We're going to do lots of questions about the Earth. The Earth. Welcome, the welcome Earth. to Earth. 